started now. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Caleb Carter. For those outside of uh, IMAP, uh, I study or I do research on um, Japanese religions, Buddhist studies, uh, Kendo in particular. Um, and uh, welcome to our uh, IMAP IDOC online lecture series. Uh, the, this lecture series, it's part of a grant that I've been managing with my colleague, uh, Ellen Van Houtem, who is here too today. Uh, and the, the series is titled Reiterations of the Past, um, Reconstructions, Practices, and Places, which is nice and broad and, and allows us to invite many um, scholars working on exciting themes. Uh, this is the last year of a three-year grant. And when, when we worked on the grant, we plan to have people come in person to join us at QDI. Unfortunately, um, that all went haywire last year, but uh, it's also afforded us the really sort of exciting opportunity um, to invite uh, scholars that wouldn't otherwise be able to come to, to uh, uh, join us for these online Zoom talks. Um, so today, uh, I'm, I'm very excited. We've got Dr. Karina Roth um, joining us. And uh, Dr. Roth is a senior lecturer and research fellow at the Department of East Asian Studies and uh, La Maison de l'Histoire at the University of Geneva and Switzerland. Um, uh, I know her very well through our shared uh, field in Shugendo studies, which is a, a relatively minor field in Japanese religions. It's especially focused on um, mountain religious practices um, and, and I guess most recently, um, I had the privilege of uh, participating in um, an edited volume that, that uh, Dr. Roth was a co-editor on. I've got my copy right here, um, uh, Defining Shugendo Critical Studies on Japanese Mountain Religion. Um, but uh, Dr. Roth also works on uh, a number of other topics in Japanese religions and even beyond that. Um, material culture in Japanese religions, uh, Yamauba, or uh, how would you translate that? Maybe mountain, mountain hags. What, what's that, Karina? Mountain hags. Mountain hags, great. Um, and then today's topic of Mizuko Kuyo, um, which she'll be sharing her latest research on this and then comparing it um, across uh, the tree too. So I'm really excited about this. Um, and with that said, uh, Karina, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, so let me share. Here we go. Okay, so shall I start? Great, yes, please. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to and admiration to the IMAP team, to the way in which they transformed the restrictions of our pandemic times into a way to open up their regular conferences to a globalized audience. I'm as honored as happy to be part of their guests. And special thanks to Caleb Carter, who coaxed me into um, making this presentation today on a research project that is still in, very, in its very early stages. My talk will therefore be much um, less about presenting research results than the background settings for a um, hopefully large scale collaborative research project. And again, special thanks to, um, to Lily Gray, who did a wonderful poster for this, and I allowed myself to, uh, to, to uh, pick a little bit of it for this. Okay, so um, as some of you may know, my normal research areas are Shugendo studies, as um, Caleb has just said. In fact, the origin of this project too has its roots in my interest for Shugendo. In the course of a previous project on Enno Gyoja, the alleged founder of Shugendo, I was startled by early depictions, especially statues of his mother, in the guise of a sturdy and fierce woman of almost frightening countenance. This led me to research on the figure of Yamauba, as Caleb Carter said, Yamauba or Yamamba, mountain hags, and her connection to Datsueba, the clothes-stripping hag. Uh, these figures have in common a strong liminal aspect, in that they are very literally represent the intersection between fertility, birth, and death, while being physically set apart, as Yamauba and Datsueba, uh, Yamauba dwell in the depths of mountains, and Datsueba sits under a tree on the far shore of Sanzunokawa, the Three Ford River. 
waiting to direct the souls of the deceased to their destiny in Buddhist hells. Both Datsueba and Yamauba are at the junction of life and death, and what best represents this junction as birth? For a baby, the moment of birth means entry into life as an individual entity, but for both mother and child, it also means the moment in which their lives are at utmost risk. In our current society, maternal and infant mortality has shrunk so dramatically as to be almost forgotten. But until less than a hundred years ago, giving birth as well as being born was a much more dangerous undertaking. Yamoba are often depicted as ogresses devouring, devouring child, children, yet they also have a mirror image of caring, nurturing old women and as midwives. Similarly, in, in some cases, Datsueba is represented in a double image, both as welcoming newborn into this world and as escorting deceased out of it. Both aspects are also conjugated in the Ombasama images of northern Japan, as you can see here on the two, two images. These premodern female images are co-opted by Buddhism, but clearly stand at the crossroads of much more diffuse images and conceptions of which they are a coalescence. Both Yamauba and Datsueba also leave an incredibly rich iconographic trail in yokai and ukiyo-e ukiyo imagery. My hypothesis, which is yet to be in, entirely to be proven, is that with the advent of the Meiji period, these feminine figures all but disappear, leaving a representational gap to be filled. I contend that one of the function of one of the function, functions of Mizukokuyo, literally memorial rites for water children is to give new contours to the blank space left by the earlier female figures. While this is the background from which my research project stems, my main intention today is to show how a composite religious ritual emerges in post-war Japan and later weaves its way across the globe under different guises and reformulations. The forms these rituals have taken in Japan are embedded in Japanese culture but the concerns they address and respond to are part of a globalized evolution in representations of life, birth and death. However, one more word before we get going. I believe that no research topic has been left completely untouched by the situation of planetary crisis that we collectively go through. As many of you and beyond all sanitary and material considerations, I have been following with great interest, admiration, sometimes amusement, how religious institutions, big and small, mainstream or marginal, have reacted to the pandemic in Japan and elsewhere. As a result, my own perception and understanding, as well as the inflection of my research, changed slightly in their orientation. Mark Towen's article in the, on, the, on the 2020 revisited, uh, revisited edition of the Gyeong Festival, which is forthcoming in the, the, the June issue of the Japanese um, Journal of Religious Studies, and his reflection on the nature of faith and authenticity was particularly inspiring. In a similar way, more exactly for you, uh, wait, uh, here. Um, in a similar way, the transfer of a major spring festival, the burning of the Berg, a straw figure symbolizing winter, from the city center of Zurich to a remote location in the Swiss Alps, and its rebranding as a COVID-19 deterrent, showed the wide ramifications of religious inventivity and creativity in times of need. Much more than being invented, religion and religious practice are constantly being remodeled and revisited in resp response to the social, political and economic necessities of the moment. Now, considering the Berg event as a religious practice is rather stretched. However, I do believe that by affixing it an apotropaic purport, with a precedent during the Spanish flu, it does belong to the realm of diffused, diffused or diffused religion or religiosity, as some scholars describe religious or spiritual baselines that are not directly linked to specific religious traditions. In many ways, the practices involved in musical kuyo cross similar borders between mainstream established practices and self-crafted religious practices. The expression Mizukokuyo is not as easy to circumscribe as it would seem. Although commonly assumed to refer to aborted embryos or fetuses, it englobes, in fact, all manner of perinatal death. Mizuko, water child, has no definite etymology. Although there are some early occurrences, 
they are rare. Overall, Mizuko can describe a child of not more than a few days, a child that died soon after birth, including via feticide or infanticide, and abortions, miscarriages, or stillbirth. As such, the term has no religious connotation. By contrast, kuyo, nurturing and offering, is a Buddhist expression that designates a ritual offering, often of memor memorial nature. It is a generic term that is applied to a large variety of Buddhist services, always with the intention of a reverent and grateful donation. Indeed, this attitude of respectful ingratiation is so ingrained in Japanese culture that kuyo rites are used by a large variety of other religious denominations beyond Buddhism. Let us also hint at the fact that the apparent generosity and selflessness of such rituals has a contractual side to it. Kuyo, generally understood as an offering, uh, may, uh, as an offering may also be literally understood as mutual nurturing. If rever reverence is given, protection is then expected. If such offerings are withheld or not performed correctly, be it towards a deity or an ancestor, retaliation may be forthcoming. In that sense, kuyo may also be read as a way to prevent, to, uh, of preventing potential harm from deceased spirits. And we, can, we shall go back to that. As a compound, Mizuko kuyo seems to appear in the second half of the 20th century, together with the third sense of Mizuko, referring to perinatal death with heavy emphasis on abortion. Its recent emergence speaks for itself. Although it is often assigned a Buddhist purport, Mizuko Kuyo does not have any scriptural antecedent in Buddhism, and Buddhism does not condone abortion. However, because it is embedded in and leans on Buddhist worldview, it is commonly presented as of Buddhist origin, even though it is not necessarily performed by Buddhist ritualists. As a matter of fact, Mizuko Kuyo is being conducted by a variety of religious or semi-religious agencies, often Buddhist temples, but also Shinto shrines, or institutions pertaining to the wide range of so-called new religions. When someone or a, persons they feel a person they feel related to have lost an embryo, a baby or a very young child, they can turn to such an institution and have them perform a ritual, either on a one-time or on a regular basis. In addition, a wide range of paraphernalia is usually an offer for purchase, statues, funerary tablets, candles, incense sticks, toys, etc. Statues and tablets may be erected on temple grounds and again be the objects of rituals at regular intervals, depending on the type of service one has selected. My attention today is not to dwell on the material and concrete aspects of musical kuyo. Let us turn to the origins of the practice. I have said that as a combined expression and and sorry. And in its current use, Mizuko Kuyo seems to have appeared only in the, in the 1970s. Why is that? Is, peri is ritualization of perinatal death a novelty in Japan? In a 1991 article, the Israeli scholar of religion Zvi Verbrovsky claims that Mizuko Kuyo is the most important new religion of Japan. On the one hand, his statement may be understood as provocative in the sense that Mizuko Kuyo is a pervasive practice that cannot be linked to, nor seen as one singular religious strand or school. In that perspective, it may be interpreted as integrating the loose web of diffused religion or diffused religiosity, as briefly described above. On the, on the other hand, despite harking back to earlier conceptions and practices, Mizuko Kuyo as a distinct ritual is a post-World War II phenomenon, and as such, shares in, and incorporates the worldview expressed in recently emerge religious movements. I think that Verblovsky, by adding Mizuko Kuyo to the cohort of Japanese new religions, intends to underscore the fact that, I quote, the invention, though more frequently the reinterpretation of traditions, can function as one of the most potent mechanisms of often radical change, end of quote. Even if the title of his article is, remains more of a catchphrase than an actual demonstration, Verblovsky gives a panora panoramic and thin synthetic overview of Mizuko Kuyo at a fairly early, early stage in the, the historiography of the practice. In his conclusions, he foresees that Mizuko Kuyo would follow the decline of the abortion boom and that both will die out as a mass phenomenon. While he was right in his assumptions, I believe that he had not foreseen the vagabond destiny of Mizuko Kuyo on the one hand, 
nor, on the other hand, did he fully acknowledge the fact that the ritual is the Japanese declension of a worldwide evolution in how the beginning of life is perceived, in great part due to the radical changes in medical technologies over the 20th century. But first, let us turn to the factual and social reasons behind Japan's so-called abortion boom, which has its origin in the reproduction politi politics in the immediate post-war years. After World War II, Japan was not only in a terrifying economic situation, it also faced an increasing population by 11 million between 1945 and 1950 with the return of Japanese soldiers from abroad. While exercising tremendous pressure on existing social and political structures, this massive increase simultaneously fostered the fear of uncontrollable population growth. During the war effort, families had been urged to breed more children to sustain the country, whereas the government now took the opposite stance, meaning a drastic U-turn in state ideology. In 1948, the government instituted a eugenic protection law, which, among other aspects, partially decriminalized abortion up to two decades earlier than most other countries. According to the Penal Code, abortion remains to this day a criminal offense in Japan. However, the eugenic protection law allowed for criteria exception that were extended in 1949 to include economic reasons. The eugenic perspective set aside, the political stance behind this law appears liberal with respect to abortion. By contrast, post-war contraceptive policy was highly conservative, leading to a contradiction of sorts. Abortion was easily available, downright encouraged, but not means for birth control, so that artificial termination of a pregnancy ended up becoming the privileged contraception method. In her relation of the process that led to the very late legal introduction of the pill in 1999, Tiana Norgren demonstrates that Japanese abortion and contraception policy is much more indebted to politics than to cultural background. During the occupation, medical and family planning interests brought about a liberal abortion policy. Until 1952, women had to appear before a eugenic protection committee to get permission to abort. After that date, designated doctors were allowed to make that decision and helped create what Werblowski calls the the um, gynecological mafia. Um, so this increased, uh, again, access to abortion. In the mid 1950s and 1960s, abortions were so common that an official of the Housewives Federation claimed young women would um, went to get abortions literally like they were going to get a perm. Parma de Moca Canico. Official figures state that some 700 abortions per 1,000 of life birth but a number of scholars estimate that the real abortion rate as late as the 1970s were possibly three or four times higher. Although Norgren is not interested in the issue of Mizgokuyo per se, she notes that from 1952 to, to at least 1988, the Japan Association for Maternal Welfare, which is generally shorted to Nichibo, sponsored annual Mizgokuyo events. Moreover, at least during the 1950s, Nichibo leaders were convinced that by performing abortions, designated doctors were performing a national service. One side effect of allowing for easy access to abortion, giving it government sanction, is that responsibility for the decision falls with renewed emphasis on the mother. Simultaneously, by being withheld access to a wider range of contraceptive methods, women are handicapped in their control over contraception and find themselves caught in a double bind mechanism. In a sense, Mizukokuyo in the context of abortion policies can therefore also be understood as filling the void, as well as the contradiction that gapes in a society allowing for a liberal stance on abortion while curtailing access to modern contraceptive methods. Families, but primarily women, find themselves caught between two opposing logics and need new representations, metaphors and images to come out of this catch-22 predicament. But Mizukokuyo itself is Janus phase because it too relies on competing worldviews. Earlier on, I have briefly described Kuyo as a memorial service, a kind of thanksgiving ritual that may be declined in an infinity of ways. 
I also mentioned that such rituals have a contractual component and uh, with, with potentially severe consequences if rituals for the diseased are not performed. Coupled to this perception is the fear that persons who die of a violent and or premature death, which precludes the normal unfolding of the su succession of post-mortem rituals, either because death happens away from home, in exile or on the war field, for example, or because the deceased has no descendants or relatives who can take, of, of, take care of the necessary rituals. Such unconnected dead have the potential to turn into angry and violent spirits, susceptible to cause great harm and havoc among the living. Japanese culture has an incredible wealth of, of names and stories for such dreaded beings, be they Onryo or Goryo in classical Japan, Yukai, Yokai or Yure in the Edo period. Many of these representations are shared with the whole sphere of Chinese influence. Children who die the prematurely present a particular difficulty. In a way, they are doubly unconnected, as they also pertain to the Mu'en unconnected category when alive, as long as they are not a full member of society, meaning a grown up, a, a become person, Seijin. In a study on medieval Japanese society, the historian Kuroda Hideo provides a graph depicting the symbolic representation of a life cycle. It remains valid far beyond the medieval period in, su in its suggestion that both ends of life, birth and death, ought not be seen as clear-cut points with a definite before and after, but understood as intermediary zones in contact both with this and the other world. Um, so that of Kami and Buddhas, which is also that of ancestors. This fluidity between worlds, as well as the gradual acquisition of personhood, provides a conceptual background in which children could be returned, kaisu, to the other world, one of the euphemisms used in the context of infanticide or pruning, mabiki. The idea of returning a child simultaneously held the, the hope and promise of its coming back at a later stage, under hopefully better circumstances. At any rate, in all societies, the death of a child before its parents' demise, at whatever age, means that the natural order of life is disturbed. Concurrently, it poses the, the insoluble question of the integration into the family tree of young people, transforming them into ancestors before their time. All these unraveling themes provide ideal opportunities for projecting fears of the unknown under images such as restless or wandering spirits. From a representational point of view, Mizugokuyo is thus founded on two competing logics. It is based firstly on a declension of the near universally fear of unconnected spirits of children who died too young, and secondly on the fraught need to integrate the soul of the diseased into a family line as a newborn. Such dilemmas seem to constitute strong undercurrents of representations in many different cultures, possibly even all of them, under one form or another. You may have noticed that I speak more of children than of aborted fetus, uh, embryos or fetuses. Although Mizuko Kuyo emerged as a practice and ritual focalized on abortions in the middle of the 20th century, it is one facet of a much wider nexus of representations surrounding perinatal death. The highlight on abortion is due to the historical and political contingencies that are presented earlier in direct connection with Japan's post-World War II situation yet relying on its earlier cultural background. However, too strong a linkage between abortions and Mizugokuyo occults the fact that this ritual has in fact a broader basis, including all aspects of antenatal, anti and perinatal death. Another important element is not always strongly emphasized. Mizugokuyo is fundamentally linked to the understanding of what the beginning of life means. Although rudimentary funerary rituals were performed for dead infants in pre-modern Japan, they were distinct from those performed for adult diseased. Usually children were not given posthumous names, kaimyo, precisely because children were expected to be born again. However, this perception changed in the 20th century, as did the understanding of the beginning of life. The newly created rituals were akin to those for adults and mostly included a posthumous Buddhist name. The peak in abortions in Japan occurred in 1955 with an estimated 1,100,000 recorded cases for some 2 million non-recorded ones. 
Japan bore the sad nickname or label of abortion paradise, Chizetsu Tengoku Nihon. At the same time, uh, at the time, sorry, Ms. Kokuyo as a right and practice was only in its germinal stages. Moreover, as shown by anthropologist Suzuki Yuriko, it was not initiated by those women who experienced it in their own bodies. After the abortion boom in the 1950s, numbers gradually fell and in 1974, recorded abortions were down to 700,000. Even if it is difficult to ascertain the actual accuracy of the numbers, the decrease is nevertheless significant. In most research on Ms. Gokuyo, the 1970s are presented as the apex of this ritualization. Norgren and Suzuki's findings shed a different light on this interpretation. On the one hand, their research shows that, in the 19, that the 1970s were not the period in which the largest amount of abortions were performed. On the other hand, in that same period, abortion gradually ceased being considered normal in, in um, brackets. Simultaneously with the drastic decrease in infant, mor in infant mortality rates, the sense that lost children would be reborn or re reincarnated, umare kawari, also lessened. This factual change had implications as well as repercussions on the symbolic representations associated with infant death. In pre-modern Japan, it was rare to perform funerals for an aborted, aborted, miscarried, or stillborn child. Since infants were not considered as fully formed persons yet, their death was not perceived as entirely unnatural. By contrast, throughout Japanese history, unnatural death were a wholly different matter and very much to be feared, as shown by the paradigmatic example of um, Sugawara no Michizane. In contemporary Japan, musical rituals are based on the idea that the death of an infant is equated with that of a person and therefore unnatural. As such, the spirit of the dead infant gains the same potential dangerosity as that of a fully grown person. The reasons for this change in perceptions, um, for these changes in perception are complex, but uh, anthropologist Chimizu Kunihiko offers two starting points. The first is the fact that according to the post-war human rights definition, children have the same rights as adults. The second reason is of an entirely different nature. Although the trend started early already in the Meiji era, by the 1960s, almost all births were performed in hospitals. The medicalization of the birthing process has had repercussions at a great many level, at great, at great many levels. From 1966 onwards, the introduction of ultrasound echography allowed to distinguish the embryo, which contributed in giving the fetus the status of a person. This evolution is, of course, not limited to Japan, and the change from incremental life growing hidden from view in the, weather, in the mother's womb to a visible living entity brought about radical, a radical change in perception. In the Japanese context, this evolution also pr produced an important correlate. If an embryo is seen as a person, it mean, it, this means that it's death by way of abortion or infanticide, both premature and violent, becomes unnatural and rises the dormant fear of retaliation, tatari, occurs. However, unlike Edo period representations of birthing yokai, like the ubume we've seen in, the, in an earlier slide, it is not the spirit of the, the dead mother anymore, but that of the dead fetus that is dreaded. According to Shimizu, this overall evolution fostered the advent and success of Mizuko Kuyo. Suzuki Yuriko arrives to similar conclusions via the development, the development of medical technologies and their influence on representations of fetal life. The prevalence of ultrasound diagnosis gradually gives rise to the idea of, of embryonary consciousness. This perception in turn led, according to her, uh, to the advent of Mizuko Kuyo. It makes, makes no doubt that certain, <clears throat> uh, certain early Mizuko Kuyo providers made use of medical imagery to promote, their, well, um, to promote their services by playing the card of vengeful spirits in terrifying ways, printing ads with images of fetuses haunting the ex-mothers-to-be. However, Suzuki suggests an origin both parallel and different to the emergence of Mizuko Kuyo rituals. As a matter of fact, even if any mention of abortion draws immediate attention to the emotions and potential psychical damage 
on part of the mothers, other actors are to be drawn in that emotional cycle too. Before 1948, no regulation existed for anti- and perinatal death, and biological remains were disposed of in the same way as surgical waste. In September 1948, when the eugenic protection law was um, just being ratified, a regulation on cemeteries had just been signed off, according to which fetuses beyond four months were to be inhumed. In parallel, however, the law did not give any time limit for abortions. The unique criterion taken into account was the viability of the fetus outside its mother's womb, so that abortions up to the eighth month of pregnancy were not rare. When abortions were performed this late into the pregnancy, it sometimes happened that the baby cried out and hence must be, must be considered fully alive. In such, case, in such cases, the midwife put a piece of wet gaze on the baby's mouth to smother it. Interventions of this kind placed a burden as heavy as undue on the medical staff, both doctors and midwives. While observing that these operations also represented a significant source of revenue for these professions, Suzuki and also Tiana Norgren suggest that Mizuko Kuyo was initiated by the medical staff responsible for the interventions long before it became a practice on the part of persons experience, experiencing them in their bodies of families. As we have seen, Nichibo, the Maternal Welfare Association, sponsored such events as early as 1952. Moreover, Suzuki's fieldwork reveals that such rituals were fairly widespread, since she mentions examples in Tokyo, but also in several cities and regions of northern Japan. Other researchers concur with Suzuki and thus demonstrate that the first formulations of Mizukokuyo go back to needs expressed by medical professions in the 1950s, before spreading to the general populace in the 1970s. These results show that soon after le the legalization of abortion in Japan, medical professions considered unborn babies as persons. Nevertheless, the fact that embryos started being considered as persons did not result in opposition to abortion, which is overall considered as a regretful, but sometimes necessary resort in case of unwanted pregnancies. Moreover, aggressive campaigns by certain temples and other ritual providers do not in any way represent the norm, even at that time. On the contrary, Mizuko Kuyo is perceived to offer a means of assuaging both guilt and grief on the part of would-be parents. The 1970s and 1980s saw a massive boom in Mizuko Kuyo practices, much relayed by all media outlets, often in a sensationalist way, underscoring the wrathful potential of the souls of the aborted fetuses. From the 1990s onwards, the boom relented, and today, although there are still temples and other institutions specializing in Mizuko Kuyo, the ritual tends to blend in with the general offer of religious and para-religious services. So far, we have remained focused on Japan and seen how interconnected and intertwined Mizuko Kuyo is with Japanese history, society, and culture. However, although in very different ways from the Japanese culture boom that the world has been witnessing, in fact, the Japanese popular culture boom that the world has been witnessing for the past decades, Mizuko Kuyo has also become an export pro product. A number of studies of similar practices in Korea, China, and Taiwan explicitly state direct connection with the Japanese ritual, which each time cross fertilizes with local beliefs and traditions. From 1980s onwards, such rituals and practices have been identified in several Asian countries, especially Taiwan and Korea, but also mainland China, as well as as far as Thailand and Vietnam. Most countries of the historic Chinese sphere of influ influence share a background of potentially noxious ghosts and spirits that need to be appropriated, appropriately pacified in order to be rendered innocuous and to prevent them from coming back to haunt the living. Although similar conceptions can be found in all cultures, a terrain of shared values and images allows for almost direct incorporation and reuse. Perhaps more surprising is the export of Mizuko Kuyo to the United States. Again, with direct reference to its Japanese origins, Mizuko Kuyo has taken roots in the US in a variety of contexts, as demonstrated by Jeff Wilson's research. In Buddhist temples, 
The practice caters to the immigrant population as well as to American practitioners. Um, simultaneously, discourse on Ms. Gokuyo has been instrumentalized by both factions of the heated debate surrounding abortion. The pro-life side demon demonizes it, whereas the pro-choice side advocates it as a compassionate ritual allowing to process traumas associated with abortion. Awareness of Mizuko Kuyo in the US has also been helped by the success, well beyond academic circles, of two studies on this practice by American scholars with diametrically opposed interpretations of the phenomenon. In 1992, William Lafleur published his highly influential book, Liquid Life, in which he presents a resolutely personal view of Mizuko Kuyo describing it not only under a very positive light, but as being entirely congruent with Buddhist, Buddhist ethics and representations. The image Lafleur gives of Mizuko Kuyo is one that impregnates most Western views on this Japanese tradition to this day, that of a ritual marked by generosity and compassion. In 1997, Helen Hardiker takes a stance in direct opposition to Lafleur's. In marketing the menacing fetus, Hardegger accountants Lafleur's optimistic views in a militant feminist manifesto. She heavily criticizes a ritual that she con considers, considers as depriving women of all agency and as sentencing them to constantly rekindle feelings of guilt. Both books were translated into Japanese and constitute baseline references in research on Mizuko Kuyo to this day, each on one end of the interpretive spectrum. The highly polarized positions defended by both authors may have contributed to the fact that other more nuanced studies remained in their shadow. So far, I have hinted at two different aspects of Ms. Gokuyo as a culturally itinerant set of practices. In the case of Asian countries, enough aspects of the cultural and religious backgrounds allow for Ms. Gokuyo to be easily incorporated and in embedded into existing customs. The situation in the USA is more complex, as Mizuko Kuyo is interpreted and appropriate, appropriated at different levels. In the case of Buddhist temples, catering mainly to an immigrant population with a strong link to Japanese Buddhist traditions, it is a simple transposition from the Japanese form, again almost without exter any external adaptation, as you can see in the, in the uh, proposition of the Koyasan Buddhist temple in Los Angeles. Some American Buddhist priests take up Mizuko Kuyo in a more or less adapted form, but as of now, I have not encountered examples outside Jap Japanese American Buddhism. The appropriation of Mizuko Kuyo discourse in the US seems to stem more from non Buddhist circles. <clears throat> Although they are part of the wider context of perinatal death, the interna international variations of Mizuko Kuyo that I've taken up all concentrate on its most salient feature, that of a memorial right for abortions. In Asian countries, this was the case because they can rely on pre-existing images, but also because comparable birth control policies had been implement implemented during the 20th century, equally leading to very high numbers of abortions. In the United States, the stringent debate on abortion-related issues has led to a certain notoriety of Mizuko Kuyo as a Japanese way of dealing with grief in that context, be it viewed under positive or negative light. In Europe, the ritual in its Japanese version does not seem to have an echo comparable um, to what we have seen elsewhere, potentially because the abortion debate is overall less heated. The, this does not mean that it is absent or that it does not harbor controversial issues. On the contrary, a number of recent media reports show that the perceived invisibility, this term is often used, surrounding these questions is more and more brought to the fore. However, when it comes to ritualization, practices related to abortion seem to be subsumed under the more generic umbrella of perinatal death. In the same way as that Buddhism provides the cosm cosmological rationale behind ritualization of death in Japan, in Europe, funerary rituals have been embedded in Christian representations for the past two millenaries. In many ways comparable to the dismal shores of the Japanese river of Sai, Sai no Kawara, the idea of a limbo for children who had not had the chance or time to be baptized appeared around the 12th or the 13th, 13th century. All over Europe, 
but somehow particularly so in the Alpine regions, so-called respite sanctuaries were built. Small chapels to which stillborn babies were brought to be revived, just long enough to catch up on the ritual, since a person must imperative, imperatively be alive to be baptized. In this context, much as in the Sai no Kawara imagery, the fear factor goes to the post-mortem fate of the unborn child, rather than on a possible retaliation from its part onto its family or society as a whole. What interests me today, uh, however, are the contemporary aspects in ritualization of perinatal death. And I would like to turn to some concrete examples in Switzerland, where I live, and where several state hospitals, hospitals as well as private associations, provide ritual services for perinatal death. These approaches are almost entirely devoid of religious connotations, but clearly result from the same perceived necessity of dealing with grief in the context of perinatal death at a symbolic and ritual level. Every year at mid-March, on, um, on a Saturday evening, the Geneva University hospitals hold a ceremony to commemorate anti-neo and per perinatal death, be it medically induced or spontaneous. The ceremony is public, dedicated to parents and families having suffered such loss, but also for the medical staff and anybody else wishing to take part in it. I attended the last ceremony to be conducted on March 16th in 2019, because it's in March and 19, uh, 2020 was canceled and uh, the 2021 version um, is um, event is soon to be announced, should be held in June. The structure of the annual event is straightforward. It lasts for about an hour and starts with a story told each year by a different storyteller, followed by a symbolic activity embedded in the thread of the story. After the activity, the audience reconvenes and the storyteller concludes. The venue ends with a small party. In 2019, one of the senior obstetricians of the hospital introduced the ceremony. A mother also spoke up and read a testimony of her family's experience. After the first part of the story uh, by the storyteller, the audience was invited to walk over to tables that had been set up in the back of the room with colored pearls and stones and material to craft a key holder in the memory of, uh, memory of the lost child. Almost all the attendees stood up and started to create each their, each their own artifact. The common arti activity, which lasted no more than 20 to 30 minutes, created a palpable bond and sense of community. The key, key holders could then either be used as keepsakes or hung on the branches of a small tree set up next to the stage. The atmosphere was solemn, yet light and peaceful. A number of medical staff were present and many families would stop by those whom they recognized for a word of, word of thanks or for exchanging some news. In the hall where refreshments had been prepared, information on a variety of associations focusing on issues related to perinatal death was laid out on a desk. Although the hospital chaplain was present, the event had otherwise no religious connotation. In the following month, I conducted two interviews with jo Jocelyn Bonnet, one of the head nurses and midwives who had contributed to the gradual changes in the treatment of perinatal death at the hospital in the 1990s. When she started working at the hospital, stillborn babies were still immediately hidden from view and taken, paradoxically, into the newborn section. The first measure that was introduced to create some porosity between the babies, the families and the staff was to take polar Polaroid pictures of the babies. Since they were instantaneous printouts, these pictures had the advantage that they could be immediately handed over to the parents who wished to keep them. The next step was to set the pictures apart for parents who might come back later, sometimes several years later. Since a few years ago, a Swiss German association, um, Star Child in dialect, sends boxes to hospitals with small artifacts and clothes adapted for tiny bodies, knitted and sewn by members of the association. Similar associations exist in different countries, including, including Japan, as Yasui Manami explains in a recent account on fetal death in Japan. Since photos can sometimes be disturbing, feet or hand imprints are another possibility. Although there is no specific allocated room or space for the bereaved families in the hospital, 
A transport transportable wooden panel is set up in the birth room with a painted stained glass design, a small desk and artificial candles. Parents are invited to decorate it if they want to. It took long negotiations to be able to keep the diseased babies in, in the hospital for as long as their mothers were hospitalized. Um, then parents can have funeral companies collect the body of their child, but for those bodies who are left behind, since about 2015, upon discussion with the manager of the incinerator, the remains are sent off collectively to one of the municipal cemeteries, where they are incinerated once or twice a year, all together in one small box. Over the course of Mrs. Bonner's career, there has been a clear change in perception of the deceased baby's bodies. From being considered and treated as surgical waste, much as they were in Japan, they have become persons with distinct lives, as short as they may have been. Both Mrs. Bonner's experience and the annual remembrance ceremony show a clear evolution in the way in which embryos, fetuses and babies are perceived in the context of anti neo and perinatal death. This evolution is reinforced in the context of a large hospital, such as the University Hospitals of Geneva, um, which is one of the biggest in the country. Um, also because it caters to the neighboring French population, so it, it means a big uh, reservoir of people. Because university hospitals are both the largest and those most often confronted with complications, medical staff is also most exposed to difficult birth procedures. Although in a much, le much less acute and dramatic way than was the case in post-war Japan, the ritualization set up and offered by the midwives helps also them to deal with their more, um, more traumatic experiences. The last example I would like to draw upon is another memorial ceremony, also conducted on a yearly basis, which takes place on the grounds of the St. George Cemetery, the, the largest of Geneva's municipal cemeteries. This ceremony is held every year in, in May and co-organized by the Municipal Funeral Service and a per parents group called Association Cali in the name of the stillborn son of it, one of its founding members. The ceremony was designed by a Geneva artist, Carmen Perrin, and its conception is very simple. She chose a beautiful big cedar tree in the cemetery and suggested that for one full month, 49 small wind chimes the, the, the wind chimes are about 25 centimeters um, in height, be hung in the tree. The 50th of much larger size remains all year long. Each chime has a different tone and even with the slightest breeze, they resonate and respond to one another. On the date of the ceremony, the Saturday closest to the full moon in May, people congregate, congregate under trees under that particular tree, and can write a message for the child on a piece of silk paper. Then they choose one of the chimes and an employee of the funeral service plucks it with a long perch and the paper is placed inside a little metal container above the wind chime, which you see on this image, you see here. Where, where the weight remains, the paper remains there and the chime rings softly along with the other chimes. This year's ceremony took place last Saturday on May 29th and I attended it for the second time. There were some 30 to 35 people attending, mostly couples and families, often with their other children. Like last year, the atmosphere was emotional, yet serene, with quiet con conversations being conducted here and there. Although some couples come only once, most do so regularly, and the pleasure of meeting again, the importance of sharing that particular experience is palpable. The manager told me that there's usually one midwife, one midwife who attends, as well as occasionally parents who lost their child many years ago and who find solace in this event. <clears throat> Under normal circumstances, it, again, refreshments are offered at the end, but uh, this year it was not possible. <clears throat> in the highly secularized context of Swiss hospitals and international cities, a definite need for a ritual is expressed in the variety of propositions surrounding perinatal death. At the same time, Yasui Manami describes exactly the same phenomenon taking place in Japanese hospitals, where clothes for babies, photos and imprints are equally provided to bereaved parents. As a matter of fact, Yasui ref reflects on a shift towards bereavement care in the Japanese context that goes well beyond the perinatal death environment. In the field of obstet obstetrics, Yasui explains that bereavement care is now perceived as necessary 
in light of the change in, in which fetal death is perceived. Because mothers are often older and or because IVF has been used, the loss of life is considered less re replaceable, to speak crudely. More, moreover, hospital births are expected to be safe so that any adverse event regarding mother or child is perceived as imputable to a human mistake on part of the medical staff. Convertedly, these factors add a stronger guilt factor and feeling of misadequation for mothers who suffer miscarriages and stillbirth. The accumulations of these changes due to a globalized modernization of medical care creates different ritual needs and responses. The collective experience provided by a shared cultural and religious background shifts towards the medical environment seen as a repository, rep, repository of trust in these cases. As such, the shared character, sharedness perhaps, of this experience can go well beyond the regional national borders. Much in the same way as in Swiss hospitals, Yasui shows that medical facilities tend to carry out the rituals they propose in a, I quote, neutral way wherever possible without real, relying on elements from Buddhism, Christianity or other religions, focusing instead on methods that allow to the, the families to grieve in their own way, end of quote. At the beginning of my talk, I said that Mark Towen's article on the 2020 Guillaume Matsuri, as well as the relocation of the Swiss Berg Festival, were part of my reflection today. In contrast to the Guillaume Matsuri, neither the Berg Festival nor perinatal death rituals in Switzerland are inscribed in a directly religious context. In the latter case, they even clearly demarcate themselves from a specific religious background with the aim of, non, of offering a non-exclusivity. Yet, they all partake from a shared religious feeling or sentiment because of what they address. The 2021 Berg edition claimed to help eradicating the pandemic, or at least pray for that. The assertively secular, rit secular rituals around perinatal death stem from the very real anguish and grief, both on the part of the family and of the, and of the medical staff to provide assuagement and relief from their strong emotional impact. In order to do that, they must lean on existing structures as well as create new ones. Religious worldviews and institutions may be part of such structures, but can also constitute an obstacle in an environment in which a neutral cultural and religious background must be stressed, as is the case in the university hospitals of a city as international as Geneva. The Swiss examples I presented are again neither religious nor do they center on abortions. You may wonder why we strayed so far away from the topic I chose for this talk. But I believe that the recent rituals that I have described just now respond to the same fundamental needs as others that I inserted in the, into a clearer religious framework. While I was watching the ceremony last Saturday in, in, at the St. George Cemetery, a woman with an Islamic veil walked by because this, this cemetery holds um, so-called confessional sections. And I could not help wondering what she might think of that particular proposition. People who pertain to a religious tradition or institution that issues strict guidelines will or will not find answers within that frame. In more secularized environments, the need for events or ceremonies that accommodate a diffuse sense of religion or religiosity with no precise anchor expresses itself in different ways. Through the wide arc we covered today, from Mizukokuyo in Japan to its declensions in other countries and via other countries to bereavement care in Japanese hospitals, I intended to show the malleability and porosity of discourses surrounding this, uh, perinatal death. Most, if not all of them, are situated on the margins of religion and ethics, yet they are central to their purport because they relate to the issue of life and death with birth at their core, which ultimately remain the most fundamental questions in our lives. The different ways in which either Mizukokuyo in its narrow sense or ritualization of perinatal death in a more inclusive understanding circular, circulate around the globe demonstrate that the transcultural flux of information and culture does not only concern objects such as J-pop or K-pop, manga or anime, but that undercurrents of moral and semi-religious values circulate too. Thank you very much for your attention.
Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Karina, for this, this really fascinating uh, discussion on perinatal death and Mizuko Kuyo and comparisons with uh, cases in Switzerland. It's really, I think our, our audience will have many questions. Um, so for discussion, let's see, I'm going to turn off uh, recording here.